Uh, and you always have a fabulous um, speaker out there, Adrian. Uh, this evening is no different. We're very pleased to welcome Brenda Condon, Brenda Condon who's a Melbourne-based sustainability innovator, who's helped design and implement a diverse range of sustainability projects, including the design and construction of carbon neutral, climate adapted, sustainable communities, protection and restoration of wetlands, biodiversity and urban habitats, stormwater harvesting and urban farms. He is the founder and director of several companies, including the Cape Sustainable Residential Community at Cape Patterson, uh, urban farming company Biofilter, a biodiversity restoration company, Australian Ecosystems, and Melbourne Sky Farm, which is a rooftop farm set to become operational in 2020. Brendan is focused on creating a better design, more efficient, lower cost, <coughs> more sustainable, and more equitable society that is able to meet challenges of the future. So very much on the line of the, the culture as you get renewed. So thank you very much, Brendan. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Can everybody hear me okay up the back? So um, it's a wonderful honour to come and speak here at, uh, at Renews AGM. I have a huge amount of respect for the talent um, uh, and uh, the, the dedication and the commitment and the passion of the, uh, of the whole organ. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the Cape tonight, but other, some other sustainable projects we're involved in. And the Cape is a sustainable housing project and it started uh, really through my work in Australian ecosystems where each year we grow millions of plants at my nursery in Caram and we restore rivers and creeks and waterways and wetlands. And we do a lot of big wetlands for housing developers. And over the years we've won a lot of awards for our biodiversity work. And at the awards night I would talk with the developers and I would say, look, it's great we've won the the sustainability awards on the biodiversity, but the houses that you're building, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're really oversized, uh, they're energy intensive, uh, they're not passive solar, they've got high running costs. Why can't we change that? Why can't we step up and build better passive solar housing? And um, the feedback I was getting from developers were, was there's no market for that. Where's the market for that? And I would say, well, where did you test that? Where did you fundamentally test that? Uh, so in the end I thought, well, well, we'll have to build something, get off the soapbox and build something. And then uh, one time I was at Cape Patterson, which is uh, my family beach, and um, my brother was living there. And we went for a run around the town and we ran past this parcel of land uh, overlooking the coast. And I thought this is the site where we could build a really, you know, state-of-the-art sustainable project. So we bought the project and that's when we uh, began the journey. So we're all about building sustainable, resilient, low running cost homes in the states to meet the challenges of the future. Um, and the CAPE is a collaboration between Australian Ecosystems, Small Giants, TS Constructions, Sociable Weaver and Archiblocks. So just a summary of what we're doing, it's uh, Victoria's net, first net zero emissions neighbourhood of scale, 230 homes. On the coast near Phillip Island, we're averaging over eight star energy efficiency across the estate. The ho houses are comfortable um, across uh, the cool periods and hot periods through the year, they're generating a big surplus of clean energy, efficient all electric, no gas, um, we're using efficient fit out and uh, operating systems. We limited the footprint of the houses so people can't build more than 200 square metres. We're averaging about 150 square metres and the, ho the houses are also uh, uh, electric vehicle enabled. So, and we're now through the, the integration of passive solar design energy efficient fit out and solar, battery storage, uh, we're seeing quite a few zero bill homes, uh, so that, that's fantastic. Why are we doing it? It's because of climate change and I'm not going to spend any time on that. I think we've got a very uh, literate group here who understand we're in a climate emergency. Uh, but I think the big Achilles heel that we're building into modern urban form is heat exposure. Um, so that's this sort of, we're sleepwalking into a major public health exposure with the way we're building hot box houses. We saw that during the, the Black Saturday heat wave uh, where we had high mortality rates. And in today's age, uh, the state government's now preparing for, you know, what they're calling mega heat waves. So we're, we're, we're moving into this hotter um, future and we haven't built our urban form to cope with that. And we, we also have uh, uh, leading scientists uh, predicting that we're going to be hitting 50 degree days in major capital cities. We hit 48 degrees last, uh, last uh, year in Adelaide and we hit the same in Western Sydney. So it's not far away. So this is modern urban form, living the dream. And um, uh, this is a near map 
shot I took today of a, an estate in Point Cook. And then if you put a thermal imaging camera over that, you know, we're, we're building these, these hot boxes. So things really have to change and change quite quickly. And we need good demonstration projects to really stimulate and, and, and push the industry to a better place uh, quickly. So as I said, the housing, uh, current housing estates are oversized, energy intensive, high running costs, poorly adapted to climate change. Um, and we also know that a lot, of, a lot of houses we're building are not hitting their badged rating. So they're rating five, six star on a piece of paper, but when CSIRO has done a lot of studying, they're coming in well under their badged rating. So they're not meeting the, uh, the, the badged ratings uh, either. Um, and we have you know, major heat urban heat island exposure, particularly in the Western Melbourne. So things have to, have to change in the housing sector. All right, that's the heavy part of the discussion. <laughs> now we'll talk about solutions. So here's a, a nice little shot of the beach in, in front of the Cape. Here's some of our first residents. So it was a 100 acre uh, beef farm, uh, largely, largely uh, cleared with very little native vegetation. And this is the layout. So 230 homes. We also have quite a bit of open space, uh, a lot of habitat restoration, kilometres of walking tracks, and uh, everything's been laid out. All the lots were laid out by a, a sustainable architect for good passive solar, uh, for, for good passive solar access. Uh, here's a photo from about, it's probably about a year old now, of, of the project coming together. Um, and we've just built, we've built about our 35th to 40th house now. So um, we're, we're approaching halfway in terms of the sales in the project. We've got 40 houses uh, constructed. So the first thing we did was we said, I said, how do you build a zero carbon housing estate? What are the goalposts? So we worked with the ATA um, and also Moreland Energy Foundation and Sustainability Victoria to set the goalposts to aim for. And we did a zero carbon study. And the feedback uh, that came back from the group, and I think Damien Moyes might have worked on that back in the day, was aim for seven and a half star minimum rating, um, a fit, energy efficient fit out, and then at least two and a half kilowatts of solar, uh, and you should hit a net zero carbon um, house. So that was, that, they became the minimum standards that we enshrined in our planning, in, in our um, housing uh, uh, guidelines for the Cape. We laid out all the lots with good uh, northern frontages. That's the first uh, mistake that a lot of estates make is they, they have uh, difficult configured blocks. And we wrote the, the Cape design guidelines. A lot of estates have design guidelines that uh, manage uh, aesthetics, but we really delve past aesthetics and really drive performance in, in terms of passive soil performance. So the, the design guidelines are really a nice little how-to booklet on how to build a zero carbon estate and they're downloadable off the website. It's a really good resource uh, that you can download from the website. What are we achieving? So we're, we're hitting our minimum standards out of the park. Uh, we're achieving over eight star energy efficiency across the estate. Um, and we're getting very good monitoring out of, this, out of the, 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 ha the homes. We have RMIT and Deakin who have a whole lot of the houses wired up and we're actually getting the energy and thermal performance data coming out. Uh, so they're performing beautifully. Uh, we've found that the size of the solar systems has come well above the minimum two and a half star. They're, they're creeping up to four, four to five uh, kilowatts. Um, all the houses have 10,000 litre rainwater storage and the modelling that the ATA did or Renew did for us showed that the combination should uh, deliver houses with annual energy costs under five, uh, $500 or under and we're finding that they're actually uh, coming well under that. So uh, my residents are quite excited to text me their energy bills. Here's my energy bill for the last 12 months. It's minus 250 bucks. Um, you know, so it's, 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 fant it's, it's, it's uh, the proof's in the pudding. So here's where most Australian houses sit in this sort of band over here, uh, one and a half to you know, four stars. Here's the industry minimum, and here, here's where we're sitting up here, averaging over eight star energy efficiency. Um, so in terms of the design process, uh, we had to capacity build. You can't sort of play AFL uh, grand finals without doing a pre-season, and we had to really train our builders. Uh, so we got energy efficiency experts, architects and builders, and we did this big three month process where the architects would design houses, the builders would then critique them on buildability and cost, and the energy efficiency experts would give advice on how to make them more energy efficient at least or no cost. So 
we had this very interactive uh, process with our uh, five, des uh, five design houses and our builders. Everyone left their egos at the door, and, and we call it um, cooperation. So they're in, you know, they're in competition, but they're cooperating at the Cape, and everyone gives everyone else a leg up. So it's a really nice collegiate feel amongst the building and design group that we've, we've managed to inculcate at the Cape. Every time the designs came back and were recosted and optimised, we saw that the prices dropped. So for me, uh, trying to eliminate the premium people pay for sustainable houses was a key outcome. Let's try and make it affordable. Bust that myth that to build houses uh, sustainably uh, is not affordable. It may be to do one-off houses, but when you do it across a whole estate, you get economy of scale into, and you build up that skill set so your builders become very, very skilled and quick. At, at sealing up houses and, and delivering higher quality outcomes. So we found we reduced the premium for sustainable housing. We've been using common materials, so there's no space age exoskeleton of the space shuttle materials. Um, you know, plantation timbers, weather text, corrugated iron, uh, rammed earth, low carbon uh, polished concrete floors. So we really wanted the whole trade, uh, the whole industry to be able to follow in our steps and not say that we're using some sort of fringe material that's, that's too costly or experimental. That's been a, been a good thing. Uh, we've done work with our builders to uh, reduce their, their landfill waste as well. So we've got uh, builders who, who do manage their sites really, really well and have that sort of uh, uh, that environmental management in place. We've also experimented with some interesting stuff like granitic sand from the coast. So we get that granitic sand, mix it with 5% cement, and then we press it in a block press. So it's a hydraulic press, puts 20 tonne of pressure and pops out these beautiful granitic sand bricks. We dry them for two weeks and then they can go straight into a house. And it's really lovely thermal mass. So that's become a really, really you know, popular thing um, across a lot of the, the homes. Um, so that, that's been fun. So I'm just going to show you some of the photos. Here's just a quick flick through uh, some of the, the houses we're seeing. That's a, a, a 10-star house at the Cape, um, at the Core 9, 9-star home. So you can see that there's just a, a range of different types of, um, whoops, sorry, of homes and forms and architectural expression. Some really lovely stuff. So we really wanted to have some you know, nice finishes. So we also busted the myth that sustainable houses are close to teepees or mud brick yurts. Um, you know, so you can see here's a typical house, double glazing, nice northern orientation. It's got reverse brick veneer, polished concrete, uh, excellent insulation right around the whole, the whole home and, um, and cross flow ventilation. So you can see that you know, they're, they're lovely finishes, non-toxic paints, uh, zero VOC or low VOC um, off-gassing, uh, plantation hoop, hoop pine timbers, uh, and so on. So just a few you know, uh, internal photos of, of, of the home. Gas-free, so uh, it's a gas-free estate. We're using heat pump, heating, cooling, and, and, and hot water, and induction cooktops to eliminate the use of household gas, and that's just a major saving um, across the estate. So these are come standard in, in all, all the homes. Uh, and the reverse, the reverse cycle split systems. So I guess one of the great things I've had is this angel on my shoulder called the ATA or Renew, who has advised me all the way through. And there've been this constant group of peer experts who I can tap and they, and, and they say, you know, the, the latest economics are showing that this is what you should do next. And these are, the sorts, these are the sorts of approaches. So I think we're a constantly evolving center of excellence. And I think by the time we finish, we'll be doing dif different stuff again. But having access, uh, to the brains trust of this group uh, has just been absolutely critical for me uh, as we've worked to deliver this, play, this project in coal country, the old coal country down at Wonthaggy, Cape Patterson. We're a kilometre from the first coal mine opened in Victoria. Um, and if you can do it there, you can do it anywhere. Uh, and it's, it's just been great to have that support. Um, so in terms of water across the estate, water efficient fit off in all the, all the homes. Uh, 10,000 litres of rainwater storage per house, and we've also got efficient um, wicking be garden beds. We're also harvesting rainwater into wetlands and uh, swales. We're using stormwater as a resource in the landscape to, um, uh, to recharge the landscape and to um, promote urban cooling. So here's just some nice photos of some of the water efficient fit off. On a precinct scale, as I said, we're harvesting uh, water into our community gardens, around 3 million litres a year. 
uh, and we're using stormwater as a resource right across the whole estate instead of seeing it as a, a waste stream to be plumbed and, and um, a, a exported off site. Here's the, 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 the results of integrated sustainability and I think this is the exciting thing. We're at this tipping point now where if you combine all these approaches you get compounding benefits and you get amazing uh, health, comfort and economic uh, benefits for householders. So I think these are the sorts of numbers now that the whole industry is starting to, you know, uh, it's eminently marketable uh, from a consumer standpoint and, um, and uh, th this is what's getting a lot of interest. Uh, here's a little snapshot of the hottest day last year in our display. Uh, where the temperature got up to 23 degrees without putting the air conditioner on and and there's one of the uh, texts from there's one of the texts that got sent by one of my residents in terms of their annual bill um, we're also pressure testing uh, houses so TS constructions air pressure test all their homes and they use it as a, a way to validate the standard and quality and they also train all their staff in uh, the do's and don'ts of, of hitting those high standards in terms of the, the air pressure tests. So the sorts of things, and they also have thermal cameras, so the, the foremen walk around with thermal cameras and they say you missed some um, insulation behind that, so who, who did it, right, rip it off and you're going to get billed for it and then they don't do it again. So uh, it's called the you know, democratisation of thermography, we've got these, uh, <laughs> these uh, thermal imaging cameras and it makes it very easy now. Uh, and these are some of the learnings that the, the builders are finding. Draft proofing uh, behind reverse brick walls around plumbing, electrical cables, frame openings, cavity sliding doors. These are all the things that help them seal up the homes. And we've, we've got predictive spreadsheets for the homes which actually predict uh, when you aggregate the passive solar design, energy efficient fit out and solar, it predicts your energy bills. And this one here is an optimal house that's predicting a minus $400 a year energy bill. So we've done a lot of work and also again with the ATA or Renew um, in terms of building these, these spreadsheets to predict uh, the, the performance of the homes as well. So a lot of science, a lot of validation. Uh, this is some of the thermal data from uh, the um, RMIT and Deakin University study. So that's the external temperature at the moment outside and then this is the internal temperature. Uh, so we're getting these sort of graphs coming through from a lot of houses now and again that's, to me when I see that, that's the validation of all those years of work and training and design and, and, um, and, and controls. Uh, we won the developer, the uh, Urban Developer um, Industry Leadership Award last year nationally. So we're sort of punching up with the big, the big developers in that space. Uh, and we've just been winning a string of awards. So I think we're probably the most awarded state in Australia now. Uh, like it's, we're just sort of sweeping uh, things before us. So that's fantastic. <coughs> and I think, you know, this is anecdotal from SPOs and then I was asking Damien if he thinks this is correct, but I think we're generating probably three to, I'm gonna say three to four times as much energy as we're using. It's really exciting. If you do these super efficient estates, they can become power stations and they can be exporting power to poorly designed estates nearby and helping flatten off the grid and improving energy security. New efficient estates can help fix uh, you know, the energy security issues in, in the old built form. And we're, we're powering up a lot of the old township of Cape Patterson. Typical uh, household display from one of my residents. That's what they're consuming. That's what they're uh, that's what they're generating and that one's what they're exporting. So you sort of see these th through the estate, which is fantastic. Uh, long range electric vehicles are now starting to come into the estate. So we've got uh, a number of, them, uh, number of those appearing and the houses are electric vehicle enabled. Uh, this is a, an optimal house at the Cape that's um, just been paired with a long range electric vehicle. It's an eight star house, uh, battery bank, big solar system, um, a as well as the long range EV. And uh, these are just some of the internals. Uh, and we did quite a bit of work on this house spin drift uh, with uh, the ATA just mod monitor, uh, modeling its, its performance. So yeah, here's the, here's the fit out, six kilowatts of solar, 4.8 kilowatts of battery, and it's got a 430 kilometer long range EV. To me, it's really exciting because it eliminates gas, um, petrol, and uh, your, uh, your use of, um, hopefully use of coal fired power. Um, so this house has got no gas bill, no petrol bill, 
year-round comfort with minimal heating and cooling costs. It saves around 14 tonnes of carbon per annum. And it uses 1 20th of the energy grid usage of the average Victorian home. So again, it's really, really powerful, powerful numbers. And then we had a look at the economics and the house saves around $5,200 a year compared to a, a conventional six-star dual fuel home and a petrol car. Then we modelled uh, the, the, the payback of the, um, of the sustainability um, attributes uh, and effectively came out at about 11.8% return on investment. So that's private equity returns. You know, what are you getting for your, your money sitting in the bank at the moment? Again, this is the sort of uh, the great uh, economic uh, modelling that we've been able to do with, with help from the ATA. Um, and then it jumps. Uh, so by 2022 and 2025, these all electric homes with uh, long range EV, EVs, uh, the investment in sustainability is, is, is going to be generating somewhere between 15 and, and 18 per cent. So, and the other thing we did was we put this house through a 25 year mortgage calculator and it paid itself off in 19 years. So, so I guess this is the really, the really exciting thing about integrated sustainability now. You know, in the last 10 years, things have dropped so quickly in cost. Uh, performance has improved. Um, economy of scales in, increased. And when you marry all these things together, uh, we're, we're hitting these great economic sweet spots. So I think in the next few years, uh, with the, the steerage of groups like Renew uh, leading the way and uh, progressive developers leading uh, and then mainstreaming this, then I think we can really swing a big shift right across the industry because the numbers here are, are absolutely compelling. Now we've got this big surplus of clean energy. We're working on a smart grid and a virtual power plant. Uh, so that's something we're working with, some, again, some modelling with uh, ATA uh, and also ARENA. Um, sorry, Renew. Um, so, because we, we've got potentially grid curtailment issues with too much uh, energy coming on, so we've got to have the right kit, and also how do we manage that uh, so that we, you know, improve our energy security and optimise the economic outcomes to the residents as well. So there's still more work going on. So our, our target is to avoid to achieve a $500,000 per annum stationary energy saving compared to a conventional estate of the same size by the time we build out. And by 2030, we want to also be saving half a million in avoided energy spend. So we want to be saving a million dollars per annum combined uh, by 2030 compared to a conventional six star dual fuel uh, estate. And I think we're on, on trend to actually be able to achieve that. So they're compelling numbers. So I've got too much information here. I'm going to flick through quickly. Um, we're also, they're all NBN connected, so we're starting to see a clever class of people move to the Cape who are looking at uh, consulting and using high-speed broadband to stay connected to um, their business opportunities. Uh, we've just had a huge number of people coming through the estate, uh, learning about sustainability, a lot of media interest as well. Uh, sustainable House Day is huge. We had 2,000 people on site this year at Sustainable House Day, and we put, that's our big day for the year, where we partner with uh, Renew. And um, we just see that there's just so much interest now uh, because of skyrocketing energy bills and also concern about heat exposure and heat stress, uh, that people are really looking for solutions and, um, and coming to the Cape uh, for, for a, lot of, a lot of that inspiration. We're also uh, making house designs downloadable. So we've had more than 40,000 downloads of free house designs uh, from the Cape website now. So people are downloading these and, and running with it. Another part of what we're doing is modelling urban food security. So we're building a big, um, you know, with the drought at the moment, we're seeing skyrocketing uh, food prices. And that's going to continue to be a trend. So one of the ways we're tackling that is building a big urban farm at the Cape. So we've already built our, uh, a big part of the farm, which I'll show you in a minute. And we've got the big uh, storm, the rainwater harvesting tank uh, that, that captures rainwater runoff from the estate and we're up and running with the urban farm. We've developed wicking bed systems that are sort of pretty drought proof and low maintenance. Um, and we're producing those out of waste stream plastic from the food industry. Uh, we've in injection molding these, uh, these wicking bed systems and we can now manufacture these pop-up farms. Uh, this farm here uh, took us two hours of manufacturing time to, to make that, that, that farm there. It produces around 600 kilos of produce per annum. 
Um, they're really well engineered, robust, UV stabilised. And we've been building little pop-up test farms um, in Port Melbourne, uh, delivering a whole lot of food to charity. And um, we can now do these pop-up home farms, uh, which are really water efficient, taking organics from the kitchen, capturing rainwater from the rooftop, putting that into the farm and evapotranspiring off that water through the farm so it's part of urban cooling and, and spinning out a whole lot of food out of urban form. Here's a little pop-up farm we've just done at a, a, school in, a primary school in Springvale. It was assembled about eight weeks ago and it's just gone ballistic. Um, these are some of the wicking bed farms that are popping up at the Cape. So we're seeing a proliferation of little home farms at the Cape which uh, suggests to me that we're going to be quite food abundant uh, which is another part of climate change resilience. So here's a whole lot of these little wicking bed farms that are popping up all over the place. And here's the first section of our, our big farm. So that's about one fifth of the size of the eventual community farm. There's the, the big water tank over here. And these are all self-watering uh, wicking beds, super, uh, super low maintenance and, and, and super productive. So here's just a few snapshots of uh, some of the produce coming out of the farm. Um, we, ha we produce about a tonne of tomatoes each year uh, and we have this lovely Posada Day Festival in March um, and the whole place uh, becomes a little substrate for ripening tomatoes and we, have the, we make these beautiful um, bottles of Posada, we've got our own label and we have modelled what we think we're going to pull out of that community farm. So I had a professional food grower and she thinks we'll pull out about 130k of food uh, at supermarket prices. Um, so again, and 17 tons of produce. So again, it's, it's all very evidence-based. Uh, so you can tell your story and you can support your, your story. Other elements of the Cape, socially positive design, lots of micro parks, pocket parks, kilometres of walking tracks. On a, on a normal day, you'll meet five sets of neighbours before you've um, done your, you know, walked around the place. Um, a lot of emphasis on biodiversity restoration as well. So we've got lovely habitat wetlands, uh, which are really starting to thrive. Um, got a big tree planting program. We'll be planting hundreds of thousands of tube stock. A lot of habitat and biodiversity around the houses themselves, biodiverse gardens, um, which, which are habitat rich. And also we're looking forward to installing micro bat habitats and little uh, you know, frog, uh, frog habitats. Uh, and so on, um, and we're celebrating that, that local rest restoration of biodiversity. We've built over nature, cities need to become the new substrate upon which nature coexists with us. And with clever design, you can design nature into urban form. Here's a bird list, so two of my residents are good birdos and they've been keeping a bird list and they're up to 67 bird species on the Cape site. And I'm really looking forward to that uh, really popping this summer as the wetlands explode with life. And it's great to have, again, validation of, of the work. And, and one of them is prolific on Instagram and he's just putting up all the shots of all the birds that are moving into the Cape. Um, how, one of the ways we're managing biodiversity on the site is we've got an off-leash dog park. So we've got no cats. Cats are not allowed at the, at the Cape. Dogs. <laughs> Dogs, um, we've got an off-leash dog park which has been designed for quiet dogs and active dogs and so on. People can let their dogs and they can tear around in here, but when they're out, on leash at all times, and it's been declared land for wildlife. So that's, uh, that's the way we're protecting um, uh, the wildlife in the public zones. I won't go through the summary, I've already, already done it, and I won't go through that, that's, there's too much uh, text. Uh, I will go through just quickly renewing the Cape. So this is the, the zero carbon study right at the start, which set the goalposts for uh, the project. And a um, few familiar faces in there. Um, so that really set up the whole project for success and gave us the goalposts which were enshrined in the planning scheme and in our design guidelines, the minimum standards. And we've also done a whole lot of um, you know, uh, um, engagement with um, ATA staff members, uh, Renew staff members, slap me if I keep saying ATA. Um, at, at industry events like the, 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 the Green Building conferences by the master builders, uh, working with our builders at these sorts of events. Again, Sustainable House Day has been absolutely huge. Absolutely a run off our feet at, at those events. They've been, been terrific days. We've also done quite a bit of media together as well. So some real heavy hitting uh, articles like this one on heat exposure in our built form. 
um, through to uh, you know, the, 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 the superior economics of, of integrated sustainable housing. Um, so it's always been great to have that evidence behind us. Uh, we've been doing heavy duty modelling on a lot of the homes, the original home projections, uh, five or six specific homes, helping with comprehensive EV modelling. Uh, there's been a number of articles that uh, Renew's done about the Cape and we're, we're now get, getting analysis of data coming out of the RMIT study, so that's, that's also been great. For me it's been fantastic to see Renew try and step up and, and really uh, be a, a, a major push in terms of mainstreaming uh, integrated sustainability and lifting the resilience in housing stocks. So this has been a super exciting thing for Renew to grab the baton and run with it in this space. It is so needed. Um, and just to finish, opportunities for new, Renew. Well, I think you've got the right mix of consulting knowledge and pr practical experience, access to, to data sets to occupy a unique place to householders, communities and developers and government. I know you've got to have a diverse income stream. I think there's great potential to grow your consulting to homeowners, but also particularly to the development industry. I think the development industry will be pushed or come willingly into this space uh, soon. And I think your organisation, as I've experienced, has been absolutely invaluable in terms of avoiding missteps and delivering the best benefits to, uh, to residents. You're a unique trusted brand. Um, you're able to model the powerful economics and I think what we're going to see is smaller boutique sustainable developers leading the way. I think the water authorities are going to step up next because they've got to meet social, environmental and economic objectives. And then I think you're going to start to see other developers willing to step up, the, the, the Villa Woods and the, and the Mervacs. And I think it's a really great space for, for Renew to plug in and to get uh, you know, good consulting revenue so you can um, you know, pay for your, your, your broad remit of activities. That's, um, I'm just going to finish on these last two slides. Uh, I will just mention that we're going to be building Melbourne Sky Farm uh, next year. Uh, we've got this rooftop space. That's how easy it's going to be, just to build like that. <laughs> it's a pop-up. Um, it's a big, big jumping castle. Um, so this space here is going to be a great space uh, to have integrated sustainability and collaboration and events and all sorts of stuff. And I really look forward to seeing good collaboration with Renew in this space, right in the heart of the city. Um, and it'll host any, a whole gamut of, uh, of sustainability activity. So keep an eye out on this one and I'd love to collaborate with the organisation uh, on this. Uh, so that's, I think that's it. Keep going. Too much text. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan, who always overwhelms me every time when I see yeah. these presentations and how much you do and what a leader you in the space. And um, you inspire us as much as we inspire you. So it's so great to be collaborating with you on so many levels. Um, is there anyone who wants to do a couple, quick couple of questions? I know we're running a bit late. Yes, two. Uh, one is um, Blackwater and what consideration you to do about it. And two is the sourcing. So double glazing, all those sorts of specialised things. Did you have a coordinated sourcing arrangement or did each builder do their own thing? Uh, so, no, we didn't have a coordinated uh, sourcing arrangement, but we've buddied up with really ethically aligned builders uh, who have chased all that through their supply chain and, 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 and basically got, uh, got access to those materials. So they've, they've sort of really put the pull on the supply chain. We've set up the goalposts um, and, and uh, having those aligned builders has been, been critical. And we've been really, really lucky without the, the, the the, the, the value aligned builders um, it would have been really difficult to pull off this project, so that, that's been a blessing. And I, I didn't hear the first. Blackwater. 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 Oh. Um, no, so we're, 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 sewer, we're conventionally sewered, um, and we looked at grey water, but we've got this sandy lens, um, and we don't want eutrophic water going into a sandy lens where we're trying to restore low nutrient uh, vegetation communities like coastal heathland. So, um, so we, we, um, we, we steered away from that. Um, we're conventionally sewered, we're connected to NBN, to electricity um, and, uh, and water, uh, no gas, and, and we're connected to sewer. But we're, through really good design, we're, we're not pulling much energy, we're pulling a fraction of the energy. In fact, I think the, Damien said that I think you sent me some modelling that shows we're using 18% of the energy of a state average dual fuel home um, at, at the moment. Is that correct? Yep, yep, yep. So, so you know, 
you, you can you can get super miserly with your energy use uh, just through, through through the approaches. Yep. And, uh, if we go to the slide, just on the costing for those relative to, and I mean, you know, there's a lot of slides. But yep. What's the costing relative to conventional housing in your field and all that? Yep. And do you pay a massive premium to get in at this stage yeah. versus when you get greater economies? Uh, we, we found that it hasn't been much of a premium. When you build a really energy efficient shell, you can strip out a lot of the junk that they put in conventional houses, so hydronic heating and uh, evaporative air conditioning and gas plumbing and, and so on, and then you build it back up with the good stuff and you'll find that as you build it back up with more efficient heating and cooling systems and um, um, uh, better glazing and, and, and solar, you'll pop up above the cost. Uh, but we found that it's been around 3% premium. It's, 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 you know, it's compared to a conventional build. And then the paybacks are, are literally, you know, they're, they're, they're really, really short. So, so if you do it on scale, um, you, you get that economy of scale saving. And as I said, the builders get really practiced at it and really quick at it as well. I know we're running really over time, so yep. one or two questions I might be able to grab. Brendan, quick question, Helen. Um, Brendan, I think I've fallen in love, so I need to move down there. Um, what is happening with the tradies and those that are being inducted or inspired through what you're doing? So your one facility, what are they now doing with their practice elsewhere? Yeah, so groups like TS Constructions have changed their practice right across their organisation. But it's more that, you know, this week we're talking to the development industry in Torquay. We've got, you know, 80 builders and developers and water authorities and we're sort of spreading uh, that, that knowledge across those groups. Um, so um, I think, you know, hopefully we're making a bigger splash right across our whole industry and we're pushing, uh, pushing for broader change, inspiring that, that broader change. So, um, so yeah, the, the skill set's fantastic in our local groups, but we're, we're trying to uh, skill, skill share that across through the Master Builders Forums and others, and also hopefully through the work of Renew as well. Yeah, really quick. Yep. Uh, uh, public transport options to get back to the city. Here. Yeah. Okay. Bus. bus. We've, we've got bus. we've got a bus service from Cape Patterson. Yep. Okay. Yep. And Chris, you can ask your question in the drinks. I don't know if it's going to be really super awesome. Uh, just wondering if you yeah. were interested in uh, microgrids to solve your power problems. Well, what what are we looking at, Damien? With uh, what, what's our solution that we're looking at at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> this is where I would defer to the boffins. I can talk to you, Chris, about a number of eco estates with microgrids. There's, there's pluses and the minuses there, but yeah, this one was set up. It's got normal good connection. Um, but yeah. microgrids can work. Where they can work, they can work really well, but they don't work in all circumstances. Uh, yeah, I, I, that was that was a, a battle I had to sort of defer, and and we're really sort of looking at that one now. Is energy use, but I'm happy to take any advice that you've got. <laughs> You're right. Well, I'd like to thank Brendan once again, and also just even though we, you know, how Brendan now with some of the modelling work, how vital the, the what he has done has been for our advocacy work. So when we go to Minister's office and when we're doing our lobbying work, we go. There's this local community builder down in Gippsland Cortez Construction. They can build a house that's be up, you know, five, six star. Only costs about three, two, three thousand dollars more, and so these people are going to save two and a half thousand dollars a year in their bills. Mm -hmm. This builder just shows them on an app their bill savings, and the consumer goes, "That's a no-brainer. I'll take that one. Thank you very much." And we can actually just take that around, and it just it resonates so well with when we're talking to ministers and ministers advisors. And I think what has been so great also about the Cape is all about that capacity building. Like, you know, Brendan, you were so like, let's not bring all the people already doing it in Melbourne down to Gippsland. Let's actually build out the capacity in the <coughs> local communities, and which is a really important learning, I think, for most other estates as well. And it follows on, like, we've talked about the Cape and others in a lot of other forums um, that I get invited to speak at. And all the learnings that they've done is about all you need to do is train your, your train supplier, tradespeople. You don't have to bring all these bells and whistles on, it's just changing some techniques. Then you just do the blower door testing to show people. They get competitive about it. How do we test this time? Do we do better? And like the Office Environment and Heritage in New South Wales did a, a survey of volume builders, and those three, four key bins were the bins that came through with volume builders. We can do this change. We just need to do a bit of training. We just need a bit of supervision when we start off, and then we just need to change a few techniques. 
So it actually is possible for all of the building industry to do it. And it's thanks to Brendan showing that you can do it and people are going to buy into it that it actually works. So thank you so much, Brendan. And here's our token. <laughs>